Okay, so um, last time we talked about the uh, spirit of the uh, null hypothesis significant testing. And this week, we're going to actually play this game of null hypothesis significant testing uh, with uh, data. So um, before we um, practice how to run this um, the null hypothesis significant testing, uh, let's just start with the talking about a research. So this, um, you know, the, one of the major risk factors for glaucoma is ocular hypertension. And lowering the intraocular pressure is probably the only manageable and modifiable risk factor to um, slow the progression of this blinding disease. And so the traditional first line approach has been topical pharmacotherapy and there are quite a few options available. So among others, a newer generation of drug called Rho kinase uh, inhibitors were compared against a popular beta blocker called Timolol for its effectiveness and efficacy in a clinical trial um, started in 2014. And then they published their result in 2018 so in their study, they recruited a group of patients with either diagnosed with the ocular hypertension or open angle glaucoma, and they measured the, uh, the patient's unmedicated baseline intraocular pressure before um, the researchers assigned them to the respective treatment groups. So um, they measured patients' intraocular pressures with Goldman, and after that, they split the group of patients into three different treatment groups. And here, a baseline sample statistics of intraocular pressures for one group, where the number of patients was 206, and the mean intraocular pressure was 23.51, a millimeter mercury with a standard deviation of 1.654 millimeter mercury. So according to the uh, College of Optometrists, um, the cutoff uh, of uh, untreated intraocular pressure for ocular hypertension is uh, 21 millimeter uh, mercury and over with Goldman when when uh, the IOP is measured with the Goldman tonometry. So then the question is, are the patient's average intraocular pressure in the previous study uh, for that specific group statistically above uh, the cutoff uh, uh, guideline of the College of Optometrists? Of course, the, uh, the number looks larger uh, than the cutoff, but how do we know? So you want to make sure that, you know, if it is just a specific to the sample or not, because you know this is only the single sample you have, but what if you have different value with the different samples, right? So, you know, understandably, every sample will give you different um, statistics. Then how do we know that, you know, from this sample statistics is actually representing the population patient IOP so that we can say this is definitely um, greater than the cutoff value or not. So that's exactly the reason why and where we need the central limit theorem, if you still remember from the last lecture. So the central limit theorem is the connecting theorem between the sample and population. So this is kind of a bridging a theory that we can actually use our sample to say something about the population, something about you know how close or far away our sample mean is in estimating the population mean by taking account into the sampling variation. So now we are ready to play the game of null hypothesis significant testing. Let the game begin. Let the game begin. So, um, to play this uh, game of null hypothesis significant testing, we need to identify and state the practical question that is in need of a statistical testing. 
So the question um, I see from the study is the following. On average, is the patient's intracranial pressure greater than 21 millimeter mercury? Uh, just to make sure that they meet the criteria, so that they, they are indeed abnormal uh, in terms of intracranial pressure. So in this case, the parameter of interest. So you need to uh, identify the parameter um, to be tested. Uh, which is the population mean intraocular pressure of uh, the uh, ocular hypertension patients. So that is the population average intraocular pressure of all the um, ocular hypertensive patients. So the population parameter is represented by the Greek letter mu, right? So from this question, now we can turn this question into a pair of null and the alternative hypothesis, where the null represents the status quo. So we're going to say the population mean intraocular pressure will not be different from 21 millimeter mercury or more or less same as 21 millimeter mercury. Okay? On the other hand, our alternative uh, will be opposite to the null, where it will say, no, it will be different from 21 millimeter mercury. Uh, but more specifically, in this case, we don't care about uh, the value less than 21 milli, uh, millimeter mercury. So um, it should be bigger than the cutoff value. So our sample mean should be bigger than the um, 21 millimeter mercury. So that's what we care in this question. And once we have the pair of hypotheses, then we need to have a decision rule in place before we see the data. Well, of course, we already have the data, but let's pretend that we did not see them yet. Um, but as a general rule, you cannot have this decision rule after you see the data. So you can think of it as kind of a live betting or playing lottery. And you must place your bet before the match starts because you cannot place your bet after everything is said and done. Otherwise, it's known as cheating. Right. So now you're ready to recruit the patients after you setting the decision rule and measure the outcome variable, which in this case, patients intracranial pressures to test your hypothesis. So, um, well, we already have our sample statistics, so we can estimate the location of the parameter and express our uncertainty of the, uh, the estimate. But then how do we do that? That is the question. So remember this equation. So the, this equation um, provides the one sample Z test the statistics to test a certain population mean, which is uh, in this case mu zero. So that is some sort of testing value, right? So this is testing value um, against the sample mean. So sample mean, so we assume that this sample mean is coming from this population, right? And then we want to see how far this sample mean is um, compared to uh, this uh, cutoff value, basically, uh, in our case, right? Um, but this set test um, can only be used when you know uh, the population mean and the standard deviation. Remember that this one, this actually represents the population standard deviation, right? But in practice, it is almost always the case that we do not have that information, right? And, you know, if we know uh, the information of the population, then why do we ever bother to actually take the sample and then try to infer something about the population when we already know about the population, right? So in many cases, we do not know uh, the population standard deviation. So instead, what we do is to replace this population standard deviation with the sample standard deviation. Um, but if we do that, so that actually becomes then the T test. Now, the Z is actually normally distributed, but the T distribution is not normally distributed, even though it looks pretty 
similar to the um, normal distribution. So when this, you know, the population standard deviation is replaced with the sample standard deviation, then the resulting statistics does not follow normal distribution anymore. So here the one sample T statistics has the T distribution with the N minus one degrees of freedom. So that is degrees of freedom, N minus one. So here the N represents the size of the sample. Right? So we need to take away one because we are testing the mean. So the T statistics uses sample mean, which is fixed for the sample. However, you can, you know, change or you can have a different sample members except for the last one. That's why we take away one because there's only one fixed statistics used to calculate the T statistics, right? So that is basically the same as the you know, standard deviation. So there's a degrees of freedom and as a function of degrees of freedom, the shape of the T distribution actually changes. So what we're seeing here in the graph are the four different T distributions with different degrees of freedom. So I don't know if you still remember it, but you know, this is a knee, right? Or new in Greek, this is not V. Uh, another notation for degrees of freedom. So this is the same as degrees of freedom, right? So the, this, um, you know, yellow, the yellow color represents the T distribution with a sample size of two. The sample size of two because degrees of freedom for the T distribution is N minus one, right? So that means the sample size for this distribution is two. Right, two minus one is one, so that's what it is. So if you look at the yellow curve and the black curve, right, the black curve here um, is actually having the uh, the infinite uh, in number of degrees of freedom, which is basically the normal distribution. So if you increase the sample size, then the T distribution actually converges to normal distribution. And if you compare this to yellow one, right, and with the black one, you can see that the tail, both tails of the yellow distribution is actually thicker, right, compared to the normal distribution by this much. Right, so effectively, that'll actually uh, make the yellow curve look thinner, right, and, and at the center, right, compared to the normal distribution, which is the black one. So that is, um, you know, called the leptokurtic, right? So it looks lean, um, leaner than, than the, um, the ideal normal distribution, but um, it becomes uh, more, um, look like a normal distribution as the sample size increases. Okay, so now we can calculate the T statistics. And as we have all the statistics we need, so we can just um, use um, the T equation, which is very simple. So T degrees of freedom equals x bar minus mu zero and SD over square root of N. Um, so, um, T, so 206 minus one, so the degrees of freedom equals X bar is 23.51. And our cutoff, um, intracular pressure was 21, right? And then SD is 1.654 over square root of 206, right? So then that is in numerator is 
five one, and now we need calculator. There we go. So we need one point. Okay, so this is uh, the standard error, the mean, so that's the yeah, um, denominator Oh, where did it go? Five All Right, so And that's Okay, so that is 21, 8, 3, is it? Yep, uh, uh, yep. We'll round it to um, two decimal places. So that is our T value. So T, 205.5. A3. So what that means is that, um, so what we just did is to standardize our sample mean to the sampling distribution of the T statistics with the degrees of freedom of 205. So the size of our T statistics um, is telling us how far it is from the center of the sampling distribution, which is 21, point, uh, 21 millimeter in mercury, right? Now, then how do we make the decision if this T value is statistically greater than the cutoff value? So what you're gonna do um, in practice is that you will compare the likelihood of observing this statistics under the null distribution against the preset likelihood, which is the decision rule uh, you would have set in place before you calculated this T statistics. So this preset likelihood is called the level of significance alpha, and it is typically set at 0 0.05, so 0 0.05, which is the area under any sampling distribution representing the likelihood of observing a critical statistics or more extreme. So that's what that means. So um, let's say this is the standardized sampling distribution of T with the degrees of freedom of 205, right? Representing the null distribution centered around 21 millimeter mercury so now this zero represents the cutoff value right so this is a sampling distribution centered around uh, the cutoff value 21 millimeter mercury but now this is a standardized so that mean the cutoff is now mean and that it is shifted to um so that 21 millimeter mercury is Standardized, standardized to be located at zero in the T space, right? So that's what just happened. So that, that's what the assembling distribution represents here. Now, we want to determine if our test statistics is bigger than this cutoff. So well, obviously, we know that the... Um, our T statistics was bigger than zero because it was 21.83. So it must be somewhere about like here, um, right? Uh, but, you know, there should be a rule to be set to say that, say hands down, that our sample statistics is statistically bigger. So for example, if the test statistics is located right next to say, um, to the mean, 
okay, then the likelihood that we see this statistics at this location or more extreme is almost 50. So the exact probability that we'll see this statistics is actually found on this curve, right? But you want to consider other extreme cases because this is uh, only the single sample. Um, but in calculating the, um, the probability, you need to consider other uh, possibilities that samples can be more extreme than this. This way, right? And you just basically add all these probabilities up to the right tail end. So it, is beco it becomes... The area under the curve, right? So that area under the curve, the meaning of it is that the likelihood that you will see a certain statistics, say this one, or more extreme this way, but that is the meaning of the area under the curve, sum the probability, right? And then this is actually the, the definition of the p-value of your statistics. How likely? Um, are you going to see the statistics or more extreme statistics, right? When your sample statistics actually fall here. So, but, you know, we'll talk about this later on. But when your sample statistics fall here, then the likelihood that this will happen is almost 50%, right? Meaning that every other time you will see the statistics happen um, just by sheer chance. So the patient group, maybe the real patient, 50% of time, but other times, even normals can be this high. So you want to move this kind of boundary further to this way, right? So that um, you and also other people think that this statistics does not come by very often, right? So now the question becomes then where you draw a line to determine how far out it should be from the center. So you basically uh, need another cutoff value beyond which your statistics needs to be uh, to say that this much difference is very unlikely to be seen just by chance. And that cutoff is called the critical statistics. And that is somewhere out in the tail end. So let's erase this. And some, somewhere out here, we have T critical value. So this is a, a, a line where your statistics needs to go beyond to say that your statistics is statistically significantly different from no difference. Okay, so that represents no difference, basically. So whatever the value you want to compare, this was 21 millimeter mercury before, right? But it can be any value, right? Uh, but, you know, this T distribution is just a normalized against whatever value you try to compare. So that's what that means. So that's that T critical. So um, that is the cutoff value, right, to determine if your statistics is significant or not. And then that T critical statistics happens to be um, is the boundary beyond which the area under the curve becomes 0.05 or 5% by convention. It doesn't have to be always 5%, but that is the number people uh, pretty much always use, um, unless otherwise noted, different, uh, noted differently. So this is the T crit. So that's a T critical value. And this is boundary beyond which area under the curve 
the right tail end, right? To the infinity, it, this becomes 0.05. And this is what is called level of significance. This is another uh, summed probability under a sampling distribution. Okay. So that that is supposed to be determined before we collect the data. So you can just um, assume that your decision rule is almost always alpha 0.05 to decide if your statistics is uh, statistically significant or not. And now, how do we calculate this um, area under the curve uh, and the critical th critical statistics? Uh, we can do this um, easily with any statistical software. So let's just uh, find out uh, the t the critical statistics. You know, um, beyond which the area under the curve becomes point alpha point of five with Jamovi. Okay, if you haven't done so, um, now is the time to open Jamovi. <coughs> Excuse me, and make sure that you have installed the distraction module. Right, um, I showed you how to install the distraction module by clicking this plus sign and you go to Jamovi library um, to find out the distraction module. And uh, you, you can just uh, you know click install, then it'll automatically install the distraction module. And so to find out the um, the area under the curve um, at any um, critical statistics, uh, you can use this distraction module. So now this time we're not you know dealing with normal distribution. Now the distribution we're dealing with is the T distribution. So you have to click T distribution. So now we have the input parameters. So you need to um, enter the degrees of freedom. So what the demo is showing you is actually um, the T distribution with the degrees of freedom of one. So that means sample size two and lambda, the lambda here, the, the Greek letter lambda here is at uh, the center value. So that is just a so location parameter basically. Uh, so this is zero. We don't have to change it, but we have to change the degrees of freedom to 205, right? So that was the degrees of freedom for our sample. And if you do that, see, that looks more like a normal distribution. So from here, um, because we do not know uh, the actual critical statistics beyond which the area in the curve becomes 0.05. So we do not use this function, okay? Because to be able to calculate the probability, then you should be able to know, you know, where is the cutoff value, right? Uh, the, or the boundary value to calculate that <coughs> probability. So this is an inverse process where we need to find the critical statistics on here, right, on the axis of t values, where it becomes 0.05. So, um, you just take the compute quantiles, and the p value becomes 0.05, right? And this, as I said, the area under the curve represents cumulative, the summed probability. So, so this is giving you, so by convention, you know, when you calculate the, um, um, the cumulative distribution, the area under the curve, it always starts from uh, the negative infinity to up to a certain point, right? So that's what um, this distraction module is doing, right? It's adding all the probabilities from the negative infinity up to this critical statistics, which is a negative 1.652. So up until that critical statistics, the area under the curve here will become 0.05. So that's what it is, right? 
But this is not the tail end um, that we want to uh, calculate the area under the curve. It is actually this side, right? But um, if you think about the property of the t-distribution, it is perfectly symmetrical about the center, right? So you um, can just uh, flip this over to here, and it's going to be just mirror symmetry, right? So um, the t critical value here is a negative 1.65, so and the positive 1.6, positive 1.652, and beyond will give you the exactly same um, alpha 0.5 or the p uh, 0.5 basically. Or if you want to um, calculate the uh, the other side of the uh, critical statistics, then what you can do is to one minus this p value, so that becomes 0.95, right? And that is uh, the other side of the t critical statistic, which is exactly the same, right? Um, the 1.652, but we have just different side. But what it just uh, calculate is the area under the curve from the negative infinity to this point, right? So the area under the curve below this p uh, statistics will become 95%. So what that means is that the remaining right tail end will be uh, 0.05. So this is another way to find the T critical statistics using this distraction module. And finally, um, <clears throat> we can calculate the P value, uh, which is the summed probability of observing the sample statistics as big as the one we have or more extreme. So. In this case, our sample statistics becomes the boundary to calculate the area under the curve, which is the p-value of the statistics. So this is the same as the level of significance. Um, the only difference is that you can only calculate the p-value after you know uh, your sample statistics, whereas um, the alpha 0.5 is preset. And, you know, regardless of your sample data, it is always 0.05. So let's say <clears throat> here is the critical statistics, right? Where beyond which the area under the curve becomes 0.05, right? So this is uh, already given uh, even before you look at the data. But the p-value is the uh, probability that you will see your data or more extreme. So say if your statistics falls outside, so that is t-test, that is your sample statistics, then the p-value becomes, so this becomes the boundary of the p-value, right? But this is the p value. Okay. So if your data falls below the t crit here, but that is another sample statistics t test i, right? then the probability that you will see this statistics here and more extreme will become this area under the curve E prime. Okay, so that is the definition of the p-value. And now, if we, so how do we calculate the p-value? Again, we can just go back to Jamovi and just uh, enter this, um, you know, the um, test, test the statistics to find out the area under the curve, right? So in this case, we know the boundary. Um, so all we have to do is to find out the cumulative um, probability 
using this t statistics as the boundary value. So if I just So oh, this is our previous um, you know, Jamovi. So now we don't have to change you know, anything here because uh, it's all the same. Now, instead of a compute quantiles, you need to calculate the probability. And we know the cutoff value. So that this time the cutoff value becomes our test statistics. I think it was 21.83, right? Um, so let me see. Was I think it was right. Um, so now let's just do this. And the probability is, well, it is not exactly zero, but it is close to zero. So uh, if you look at, you know, the tick marks here only goes up to four and our statistics is 21.83. So it was somewhere out here. Right, which is you know a very very tiny tiny uh, right tail end. So the likelihood that you will see this t statistics or more extreme is really really small. It is highly highly unlikely to see this uh, size of the t statistics. Okay, so now we can make the decision about the null. Um, you may find it very strange um, to make a decision this way, but it is all about the null, as the name of the game suggests, the null hypothesis significance testing. So there are only two decisions. You either reject the null, <clears throat> reject the null, or fail to reject the null. Okay. Um, depending upon, you know, um, who you ask, uh, some people will accept um, either null or the alternative hypothesis, uh, but because of the historical region, uh, reason, um, we'll just uh, stick to this um, decision uh, making. So you either reject the null or the fail to reject the null, okay, uh, based on the following criteria. So when you are comparing the p value, against alpha so you're basically comparing two probabilities right alpha is preset probability and p value is the probability of your statistics right so if the p value is less than alpha point of alpha point of five right so it is pretty much given right uh, unless um it is specifically noted that you know they used a different value but um, implicitly, it is almost always alpha 0.5. You compare your p value against alpha, and if it is less than alpha 0.5, you can reject the null. Okay? Reject the null of no difference. On the other hand, if the p value is greater than uh, or equal to the alpha 0.5, then you just fail to reject the null of no difference. Right? So in our case, our p-value um, of that, um, the intraocular pressure, right, to see that um, t-value of 21.83 is practically zero. It is a very, very small. It is obviously smaller than alpha 0.5. So that means we reject the null of the no difference, and we can conclude that we have enough evidence to support our alternative hypothesis which is that the patient's intraocular pressure on average is greater than the cutoff value of 21 millimeter mercury okay so this is one way to make a decision right so you compare two probabilities and if the probability that you will see your statistics is less than less than the um the preset alpha 0.5 then you reject the null of no difference and you have strong enough evidence to support your alternative hypothesis which is typically your research question you can't use 
statistics to make the same decision, to write the same decision. So the T statistics, right? In this case, we have T statistics. If your T statistics is greater than critical statistics, right? Then you can reject them all. Otherwise, you fail to reject them all. So in this case, our statistics, this was 21.83, and our critical statistics was 1.652, right? So because our test statistics, sample statistics, is greater than the critical statistics, so uh, we reject the null. In fact, these two are uh, related, right? So you can only calculate the p-value based on the sample statistics because that you know that your test statistics becomes the boundary to calculate the p-value. And alpha is the same thing. You can only calculate the alpha when you know the critical statistics. So whichever criteria you use uh, really does matter. But the most preferred way to make this uh, make the decision is to compare two p uh, two probabilities. So you compare p against alpha. So that's because alpha 0.05 is almost never changed, right? On the other hand, t critical statistics the uh, t critical statistics um, always change according to the sample size, right? So you have to calculate the uh, the critical statistics uh, for different samples, right? However, you don't have to change your alpha because it is pretty much always, almost always 0.05. So the preferred way to make the uh, decision is to compare two probabilities, so P against alpha. So if this is just too complicated to make a decision, then you all, you know, all you have to remember is to compare p against alpha 0.05. If the p value is less than alpha 0.05, then you reject the null and you have strong evidence to support your alternative hypothesis. That's all there is to it. Um, otherwise, you just fail to reject the null. And you do not have um, strong enough evidence to support your alternative hypothesis, which is typically your research hypothesis. Now, let's rewind what we have done and restart from the beginning. So first, state uh, in playing the game of null hypothesis in testing, you first need to state the practical question um, that you want to test by statistics. So we did. Um, so the question here is the on average is the patient's IOP greater than 21 millimeter mercury? So we just want to make sure that they, as a group, have indeed higher than normal intracranial pressure. So uh, the next step is to um, identify the parameter of interest, which is the population mean IOP of the ocular hypertensive patients, which is the outcome measure of the study. So from this, uh, so from this research question, now you convert the research question into a pair of a null and the alternative hypothesis, where the null represents the status quo, saying the population mean intracranial pressure will not be different from the cutoff. On the other hand, uh, our alternative will be that the average IOP of the patients will be bigger than the cutoff value, which is what we uh, expect to see. Um, so once we have the pair of hypotheses, then we need to have a decision rule in place before we see the data. And the decision rule was um, alpha 0.05, right? Alpha 0.05. So your decision rule will be that um, if the p value, the likelihood that you will see the test statistics is less than this value, right? Then you will reject the null. Otherwise, you fail to reject the null. That's all there was, uh, all there is to it. So you use this alpha 0.05 as your uh, criteria. Now you're ready to collect the data, calculate the statistics and the p-value to test the uh, hypothesis. And it turned out to be this. 
So T degrees of freedom plus 21.83 and the P value, even though um, we uh, weren't able to uh, get the exact value, what you can say is that less than 0.05. Okay. So this way, we know that the p-value, I mean, at, all we know is that p-value is very close to zero, and pretty sure that it is, um, you know, less than 0.0001. But all that matters is that the p-value is just less than alpha 0.05 to reject null. So that's all that matters. So now we can make the decision. So as the p-value is less than alpha 0.05, we reject the null, right? We reject. We reject the null, and we say that the patient's intracular pressure on average are indeed higher than the cutoff value of 21 millimeter mercury. And that is basically our final conclusion of the null hypothesis significant testing. So the um, previous hypothesis testing um, is called a directional or one tail testing because our alternative hypothesis uh, was concerned about the direction of the difference which was made explicit in the alternative hypothesis. However, you don't always have to make a clear prediction about the direction of the difference because it is not always the case you know the expected direction of the outcome. So when you are setting up a pair of hypotheses, um, null is always stated as um, there will be no effect, no change, or no difference between the values being compared. So you do not implicate the direction when you're setting up a null hypothesis. Right? Because what you're saying is that basically they are the same, right? Your sample mean will be the same as uh, the value that being compared. So you do not implicate the direction, the expected direction of the outcome in the null, but you can implicate the direction of the difference in the alternative hypothesis, like in the previous example. So this is what we did. So when you, um, so in this, in, in our previous case, we expected that the patient's average IOP is greater than 21, right? So in this case, then you expect to see your T statistics to be positive, right? So this is zero. So center is zero difference, basically. And then the positive side, the right side is the positive side, and you expect your T statistics fall on this positive side somewhere here, right? And then the P value that you will see this statistics or more extreme this way is this area under the curve, right? So that's the P value. So that's the um, P that the T statistics, this location or more extreme values will be found. So that is a summed probability. So that is the definition of P value in case your alternative hypothesis um, is this. So you expect your sample mean to be greater than a certain value. So your T should be positive in this case. But you can have um, the opposite alternative hypothesis, opposite directional hypothesis, in that you expect your sample mean to be smaller than a certain value. So in this case, then you expect your T statistics to be negative. So that's negative T. And your P value will be the area under the curve bound by your statistics and to the left side of the curve. Because this is a zero difference, right? Going further away from the center actually represents uh, more you know, extreme values, right? So if you expect your sample mean to be less than some value, 
and the likelihood that you will see this t negative t statistics or more extreme is the area under the curve bound by your statistics and to the left side. So that is your p here, right? So because you so this if you do this uh, rearrange this then you move this to this side and you're going to take away see so this difference should be positive that's why your statistics to be on the right side and the same thing this you just rearrange this move to the left side mu zero becomes zero so this difference now should be negative right so when you look at your t statistics you have to actually look at the sign carefully uh, to make sure that if your statistics in the right direction as uh, in the, uh, the expected direction, uh, especially for the one-tailed hypothesis, right? But it is not always the case. You um, know the direction of the difference and you don't have to. Um, so if the direction of the difference does not matter or you're not sure about the direction of the uh, expected outcome, then you can make your alternative hypothesis two-tailed or two-sided this way right so now you place your bet on both sides right and you don't know actually where your t statistics will fall um, either to the left or to the right you don't know but you know wherever it falls as long as um, it falls beyond one of these t's right negative t or this t then you will say that your sample mean is different from uh, the certain value, the specified value here. So if you rearrange this, um, this is a mu minus mu zero is not equal to zero, right? So it doesn't matter which way, which way uh, it is different from zero. It can be negative or positive. So you can go both ways. So now you have to consider um, this side and this side together. So that's why the p-value becomes um, doubled, right? Because you're considering the both sides. And these two vertical sign around the t, small t, means, so that is an absolute value. So that t means either negative t or t. So these two vertical bar actually remove the sign uh, from uh, any value, right? So it only um, takes account into the size of the value, only the size. So if you just do this, if I say two, then it's either negative two or two, right? So that's what the, uh, the absolute sign means. Now then, let's let's look at some uh, example to run the uh, two-tailed hypothesis. So let's assume that you are running a practice in Glasgow. You hired a new IQ professional to run an exam for you and fit the glasses for the clients while you're focusing on running the practice. After a while, you're getting complaints from the clients that they cannot see well with their prescribed specs. So as an eye care professional yourself, um, now you're wondering if your clients are properly corrected to 6-6 six, six vision. So you give calls to a random clients and bring, bring them back to test their best corrected visual acuity in log mar. Of course, you're hoping that the clients are corrected to zero log mar by default, but your hypothesis is that, mm, no, they are not. So let's just uh, play uh, this game of the null hypothesis and contesting again step by step. First, you need to state the practical question that is in need of statistical testing, which in this case, on average, is the uh, patient's um, BCVA, the best corrected visual acuity log mar uh, of 0.0. .0. So that is the question you have and you want to actually test it formally with the null hypothesis and contesting. So the 
parameter of interest is the population mean BCVA, which is uh, the outcome measure of your study. And from this question, we convert the research question into a pair of a null and alternative hypothesis where the null represents the, uh, the status quo, saying that the population mean BCVA should be uh, uh, the log mar of zero, right? Or not be different from the testing value. On the other hand, our alternative will be that the average visual acuity, average BCVA of the clients will be different from the testing value, which in this case, uh, the direction does not really matter much because our goal is to show if they are statistically different from the log mar of 0.0, .0 in any direction, right? In case of myops, if it is less than zero, then the clients are overcorrected, whereas if it is more than zero, then the clients are undercorrected. So just to simply speaking, right? Um, so um, either way it goes, uh, it's not optimal, right? So they're not um, optimally corrected. So now we have this pair of hypotheses, then now uh, we need to have a decision rule in place uh, before we collect the data. And the decision rule is, again, you know, it's almost always alpha 0.5. So we will test our hypothesis using this level of significance, alpha 0.05. So now here we have the uh, collected data from uh, the 16 clients. Um, oh, so okay, so it goes. And right, so you need to calculate the statistics and PA value. And this is what we obtained from the clients. And we have 16 clients. And you calculated the average BCVA. And it turned out to be 0.05 log mar with a standard deviation of 0.0816. So there's only um, you know 0.05 difference from the optimal uh, 0.0 log mark. But given the uh, standard deviation, given the sampling variation, we'd like to know if this is statistically different from log mark of 0.0. .0. So now you should calculate the t statistics. So the T in this case and the degrees of freedom is 16 minus 1 equals so and the mean sample mean is 5 and we're just comparing this against 0 and the standard deviation is 0, 0.0 816 over square root of 16. Right, so that's how we calculate the t statistics. Now the numerator is just 0 0.05 and this 4. Right, because square root of 16 is 4, that is 0 0.05 over. 0 0.04, no, 2, and 2 or 4. Now I need calculator. So, So our T statistics is this value, 2.451, right? So, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> now we need to calculate the P value. So the likelihood that we will see this much T value or more extreme. So P equals what? Now let's calculate the uh, P value with um, Jamovi. Um, but before we do that, so once we have the p-value, then we can compare our p-value against alpha, right? So that was the decision rule. 
Um, right, so you either reject or fail to reject them all, depending upon, um, you know, your p-value against alpha. So, but before we do that, uh, let me explain, uh, uh, you know, how the level of significance is actually placed in two-tailed testing. So here, the level of significance alpha is still 0.05, but in case of two-tailed testing, you split um, the level of siblings to alpha 0.05 um, into halves and place them in both tails. Right? So somewhere here, somewhere here, and... Each area under the curve should be 0 0.025, 0 0.025. So when you add them together, uh, it becomes alpha 0.05. So because this is a two-tailed, you have to split this um, probability into um, two halves and in, into both uh, in. You know, both tail ends okay so th now the effectively the area under the curve uh, to be compared against actually shrunk by half right and because you have two um, area under the curve ac accordingly uh, there should be two critical boundaries beyond which area under the curve should be 0 0.025 each so this is where you need Jamovi to find these two critical values. Um, as you can see, um, so one value should be the negative somewhere here, and that is the T um, corresponds to the left 0.025, right? And the other one is somewhere here, positive, right? But by convention, I told you that um, it is actually 97.5th percentile, right, from the left. So um, let's just use Jamovi to find out these two critical values. Okay, so here is our Jamovi, and to find out those two critical values, you need this distraction module. And because we're uh, dealing with the T distribution, you choose T distribution. Now, um, because the degrees of freedom is 15, you just type in 15. And you want to find out the quantile that is corresponding to this area under the curve, which is 0 0.025, right? But what we need is a cumulative quantile from the left um, up to the critical point. So you need to choose this one. And then here we have the left side uh, critical value. So up until negative 2.131, from all the way to the negative to this point, the area under the curve will be 0 0.025. And because we know that the T distribution is a mirror symmetry, then the other cutoff will be, the X2 will be positive 2.131, right? So, <laughs> in fact, the what was the value? Sorry, um, <clears throat> three one. So we have two critical values now two one three one. All right, so um, two one three one is about here. So that's the left T crit. T O two five. And that area the curve come um, 
oops, alpha over 2 to 5, right? So that is negative 2.131. And here's another critical value. That's T and 7, 5. It's actually 97.5 percentile, which is positive to a point 131, right? And this is another of our two I. Okay. Now, where is then our statistics? By the way, for the um, T distribution with the degrees of freedom of 15, the middle part here is now ninety five percent, and this range here that is the ninety five percent confidence interval for the null hypothesis. Okay. And now our statistics, T statistics, was uh, 2.54, I believe. No, 2.451. So 2.451 is where? It's about here, right? So it is actually great uh, that the T statistics is greater than this value. So what that means is that this is actually statistically significant, right? Um, but let's just do the P value. So P value is actually the area under the curve bound by this to the right side. Okay, now this P value is less than alpha, half of this alpha, right, 0 0.025. So that means our statistics is statistically significant. So let's just calculate this p-value. What is the exact p-value here when the t15 is 2.451? Um, so, okay, so let's just then um, go back to Jamovi. And now we need to use this, right? Because we know the cutoff value. And that is 2.451. And calculate the probability that um, you will see the statistic or more extreme. Okay, so that is uh, the p-value, our p-value bound by our own statistics of 2.451 and the p-value here this is a one-tailed p-value right but if you want to calculate the two um two-tailed p-value you just basically multiply uh, multiply two by this probability then you will have the two-tailed probability which is a point um 026 right <clears throat> but you can still compare this p-value against the the right side of the alpha um, 0.025. And still, this p-value is less than the alpha 0.025, right? So that means you reject the null of no difference. And now you have a strong evidence that uh, the client's, um, the correction is uh, not done correctly, properly, right? And then you know that because um, this difference was positive, right? So actually they are undercorrected, uh, assuming that they are myops, right? So that is the final conclusion of uh, this study that, you know, that hired um, IQ professional actually messed up in, um, you know, filling the glasses of their clients. So that is the morale of the story. And next, I will show you how to run this one sample t-test um, using Jamovi.